Okay, so this talk is called React uh, Refracted. Uh, so React has um, a lot of interesting features that I think don't really actually become apparent until you look at it um, through a perspective that's not JavaScript. Um, I actually think um, there are lots of interesting things if you're trying to use React and you're not actually uh, a JavaScript user. It's great if you're a JavaScript user. It's awesome. But I think there are some properties about it, again, that are not apparent until you see it through a different lens. So just really quickly about myself, for those people that might not be familiar, I'm a software engineer at Cognitect. Um, Cognitect is a consultancy and a product company. We specialize in building immutable systems. I actually work on a, the, the one product that we have. It's called Datomic. It's an immutable relational database. Uh, it's pretty cool if you haven't heard of it. I highly recommend checking it out. Cognitect also stewards the closure programming language, which has been sort of um, important in sort of popularizing um, the usefulness and the utility of having fast um, immutable data structures. Uh, of course, Scala, uh, Scala and Haskell has also helped quite a bit here as well, but definitely uh, Clojure was one of the leaders. Uh, so Cognitech uh, manages the language and stewards it, but I, I also actually, actually work on something called Clojure Scripts, which some of you might have heard of, and that's a version of, um, of a dialect of Clojure that targets JavaScript. And that was uh, the fact that we had easy access to immutable data structures and sort of uh, me becoming familiar with React um, is what led me to uh, create Ohm. And we'll talk about that later. But before we get to that, uh, the, the things I'm going to talk about in this uh, are a bit, need a bit of context. Um, uh, and I want to talk about two things that sort of set the context for the last two thirds of my talk. So here's an image which I think all of you guys are familiar with, um, at, at least in this audience, and this is a, a, a chess, the game of chess, right? Uh, in fact, some of you probably are pretty good at it. Um, chess is relatively popular in the States. Uh, in fact, some of, might, some of you might be good enough that you can actually analyze the state of the board and make some, some guesses. Some of you might be huge fans and actually recognize that this is um, Bobby Fischer versus Spassky in 72, right before he made uh, a very unusual move, um, NH5. Uh, so the next image, I would strongly doubt uh, <clears throat> very many of you uh, know what this, uh, a much smaller percentage know what, know what this is. Those of you that do probably can't read the board. Um, and I guarantee very few of you know that this is probably a more famous game than the, um, the Fisher uh, uh, Spassky match. This is uh, Shusaku versus uh, Genin and Seki. And this is one of the most famous moves uh, in the game ever. Uh, but, the, but the point I'm trying to make here is the previous slide is familiar. And this one is not familiar. And I often see this problem in the software engineering space where people make judgments about something simply because they, they don't have the information yet to process it and then they immediately dismiss it. I think this is a problem that React went through. People uh, obsess about the parts that are identifiable as being something that you might not like, but then people uh, took that and completely ignored the stuff they had never taken the time to understand. The parts of React that were unique and different and were radically, a, really a radical break from uh, what JS frameworks of the day were doing. So the unfamiliar doesn't mean it's complex, right? Just because it's unfamiliar, there, it, it, there's no judgment that you can reasonably make about the thing. It, it may be good, it may be bad, but if it's unfamiliar, you have no clue, right? And it's, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely on the person that created the thing to help explain it, but it's also, it's, it's a dual responsibility. Um, it's important to not pass judgment until you've taken a time to assess a thing. Uh, the other thing, the other point sort of that sets the context of this talk is um, I recently saw a, a really great National Geographic uh, show, TV show on um, the dome, the dome of the Cathedral of Florence. Uh, this was designed and architected by Filippo Brunelleschi in the 15th century. Uh, and what I like about this image is so you see this gigantic cathedral and and it's sort of the architecture and the design and the color, it sort of fits with these smaller buildings. And I, for me, this is an amazing metaphor for software engineering. We often are building smaller systems, and then we look at the big, crazy system that somebody built, and you think, well, the big stuff, those, those are based on different rules, different systems. That's, co that's complicated. We don't need to use those rules. There's no way that something that big could be simple. And what's beautiful about uh, the this, this show is they described how Brunelleschi was able to construct the dome because they had this design constraint in which they could not have a supporting structure. The dome was too big. 
They couldn't have something holding it up. And uh, so what Brunelleschi did, he did something that a, a common bricklayer would know, which is the uh, herringbone technique. And they basically laid, uh, laid a, a spiral of bricks, four million bricks going up, right, over I forget uh, how long. And they completed the dome, needed no supporting structure. The simplest idea possible, something that, uh, again, a regular bricklayer would know, right? So this, just, this really, for me, is a great example of big, uh, has nothing to do with whether something is complex or not. So React also gets a lot of, I think, criticism because people say it's big, it must be complex. And I think, uh, you know, I'm somewhat preaching to the choir here. I think if you use React, it's, it's, it's shocking um, how simple the semantics are. And I think that's why uh, people really enjoy it. Uh, even though it may be that there's a lot of code involved, uh, a lot of that code actually presents an extremely simple system. OK, so keep those two ideas in mind with the next things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to sort of talk about uh, how, as uh, the designer of Ohm, I view React, which is quite different from how people who are not, who are using JavaScript might view it. Uh, so I'd like to talk about React as platform, right? So people are obsessed with frameworks and libraries and all this other stuff. I don't care about that, right? When I, when I see a framework, my, my immediate response is, you know, it's a framework. That somebody has made some choices because they think they, they know how, they, how I should solve my problem. It's almost never the case, right? So when I look at and, and sort of analyze software technologies, I'm asking the question, is it a platform? Um, and by that, and by that, that there, there's a, a somewhat antiquated definition of this word, which is platform, plan of action, scheme, or design. And what I like about this is that uh, it's, it's not about solutions, right? It's about a process, right? It's not about solutions. Um, so we're an architect. We pick a tool, a tool that's probably, you know, it seems to be well understood, bricks, right? We, we, are, we sort of talked a bit about bricks with Brunelleschi. So we decide we want it bricks, because bricks are very versatile, right? With, with bricks, you could build this, right? Something that's easily recognizable in the States, so just a house. And this is great. Lots of software projects, look at this. You just want to build a nice house. But with a really great platform, really great platforms allow you to build this, but they also allow you to build things no one has ever seen. No one's ever thought of, no one's ever even conceived of the thing. And that, to me, uh, is what a good platform is. This is actually the proposed extension to the um, uh, the Tate Modern. Okay, so when in the early days, ClojureScript's three and a half years old, when we were looking at, um, if we're going to build UIs with ClojureScript, we started assessing what's, what's, what's out there, what's available. Is there a suitable platform for us to build on top of? So people looked at Backbone, you know, whatever. It didn't work out. And, and I don't, there's, there's no criticism about Backbone yet. We'll, we'll see why it didn't work out. I, I haven't explained why it didn't work out. People looked at things like Ember, it also did not work out. Uh, and people looked at things like Angular and also didn't work out. But these all didn't work out for the exactly the same reason. Uh, and there's a reason why React won out. And it won out not in a small way, in a huge way. And in a way that's so big that almost any uh, sort of compiled to JavaScript language that's functional or more functional uh, has flocked to React. They're not going to the other solutions. But it's just for, it's for this reason, right? Those other frameworks have made a very deep decision to embrace the mutability of JavaScript, which makes it impossible for Clojure to get any leverage from using it, right? It destroys any advantage you might get from saying, I have a different strategy. I have a different approach in mind. Um, those tools pick the strategy for you. You can't fix it. What's beautiful about React is React is the first framework where it's like, you want to use mutation, go for it. React works with that model, right? Uh, everything we've been talking about, you can pass mutable arrays and mutable objects. It just works. But the beautiful thing is that if you want to pass immutable data, it also just works, because React did not make that decision ahead of time. And this is fantastic. This is, this is the type of thing, as, uh, as a person who's assessing a technology, I'm saying, uh, or I think, it did not make uh, a choice for me. And that's fantastic. OK, so this brings, this brings me to Ohm. So Ohm is, it was, a, was an experiment. I said, I have immutable data. I'm not going to talk about the immutable data too much because uh, uh, Lee did an amazing job describing the advantages of designing software with immutable data. So I'm not going to go into that, but I want to talk about the sort of high-level design ideas behind Ohm. Um, so Ohm started off as an experiment. In, in some sense, it's still an experiment. Um, it was inspired by this paper. It might be hard to read. It's called Worlds, Controlling the Scope of Side Effects. It's uh, co-written by this guy you've never heard of, Alan Kay. Um, 
But the paper is describing um, the sort of advantages that one might derive uh, if you have a, um, a sort of explicit time-based model and you sort of uh, have uh, state management in your system. And they, had this, they said this amazing thing at the very end, and I wasn't interested in worlds, implementing worlds, but they say this. There's a great uh, point in the reference section which says uh, most of the advantages that described in this um, publication uh, or this paper uh, is achievable through persistent data structures. And so I set out with Ohm to actually see, well, is this true? They say it's true. Let me see if I can do the types of things they're doing with worlds with immutable data structures. I have that in ClojureScript, and I have finally a JavaScript framework that doesn't assume mutation is the default. And so I set out some design constraints. Uh, number one was immutable app state full stop. So that's just how it works. We just have a single source of truth, immutable app state, nothing else. Um, async rendering via request animation frame. So I wanted, it didn't matter how fast the updates come, we always render at 60 frames a second. This means by default, all uh, updates are batched. Uh, there, you, get, you have this to some degree in, in, uh, in React, but Ohm takes it a little bit further. Uh, another thing I want to maintain is that you should be able to jump to any point in time uh, respect to the apps, with respect to the app state. So if I record a snapshot and the application timeline advances a minute into the future, I should be able to load that previous app state and keep going. It should just work. Uh, and finally, modularity. And this was actually a hard problem uh, because this is something that we had to solve um, uh, ourselves because we couldn't use the escape patch that React provides you called set state. Set state allows you to do some really nice things. Um, a lot of people uh, miss that point that set state actually kind of allows you to achieve mod modularity. But ohm, we had to come up with some other way to address the modularity problem uh, as far as making modular components. I'll talk a bit about that. So this is what an ohm app looks like. Fundamentally, you've got this little, this little dotted circle. That's your app state. We feed it into the root, the root component, and then you get the, you know, the typical React cascade, right? Everything cascades as the waterfall renders. Um, if some component wants to change the state of the application, you know, they mutate the app state, uh, transitioning it to a new immutable value, and then, you know, again, we re-render from the root cascade. Uh, that's just, that's it. Uh, so if we sort of put this in a series, it looks kind of like this. At T0, you have the initial app state. Some component changes it. Now we are at T1, uh, on through Tn. And the beautiful thing about this slide is it's exactly the same as the thing that Lee was talking about. You can record any one of those things at any point in time, and if you want to recover it, you just load it. Uh, so, the, so the history example that he showed, this is, this is exactly it. This is the simple uh, model that I want to achieve uh, with them. Um, but then there's this question. If you think about this a bit, you're like, well, the global app state idea, that's, that's interesting, but it's also a bit strange. And in fact, we immediately encountered this problem uh, in the early days of Ohm, which is that this is not actually what you want, right? So, so down here, there's, your, there's your, your, your render tree, and are you really going to pass the global app state to every component? Uh, in theory, if everybody was really disciplined about that, that would be okay. But of course, you know, you have a deadline, and what are you going to do? You, components start thinking about things in the app state as something they should be looking at when they shouldn't. And so this is a huge problem if you adopt an immutable model. How do you, how do you hide the entire world from everybody? Even though you want this, the convenience of a whole world that you can snapshot, you don't want to pass the whole world around. Somebody will make a mistake and read something they weren't supposed to. Um, so the code, code looks horrible. So all the, the advantages about immutability really go out the window um, if people are programming in this way. And so we came up with an innovation which, as far as I could tell, nobody had ever come up with. Uh, it was heavily based on um, zippers from functional programming as well as um, uh, lenses. But it, you don't need to know anything about that. So the simple idea is that what we should provide, if somebody accesses the app state using standard uh, collection methods, in immutable JS, that would be get. You want to get a key, or you want to get something from a vector. What it returns is a piece, a, a, a slice of the app state. That slice actually knows where it belongs in the, in the true global app state. But what, what this means is that I can now pass that to a component, and the component doesn't know that that thing knows about the entire app state. It just sees the window um, that it's allowed to see. And that uh, ends up being relatively nice. It doesn't solve all the problems, but at least it's um, some level of, of abstraction. If we look at uh, your app state uh, in time, there's some time t0. You've extracted a cursor by you know, getting some key. 
You pass that to a component, so the component only sees the part of the world that it should be concerned with. Perhaps it updates that state. And because the cursor knows where it came from, it can update uh, the global application state, um, which is awesome. Because now it means that all your components inside of your component tree, they only, they only see the part of the app state that matters um, for their uh, execution. And so this solved, mm, I would say, 60% of the problems with Ohm. Uh, but it turns out that uh, not everything is awesome. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is something I wish people would say more often. I mean, I love React. I think React is one of the greatest things, and, I, and I'll continue to say that. But it's also important to always be critical. Uh, usually when something is awesome, there is something not awesome about it. And actually in Ohm, the not awesome thing is that, we, again, we don't have so many escape hatches, because as the designer of Ohm, I said, I just want immutable app state to always be the source of truth. And that, you know, I'm creating problems for myself. But I want to surmount them, because I think maybe that's a better way to program. Um, so there's a problem in React, and you know, it's, people keep talking about Flux, but Flux is trying to solve a problem. So React gives you this beautiful, simple model in which data flows downwards. But then you have this, in these cases where you're like, well, I have a child component, and I need to talk to a parent that's two levels up. Why does the person in between need to know about this? right? And if you use props, you've got to pass that stuff in between. So this is the exact same problem with the, the global app state, right? You're passing too much information. Information that should not travel between two components is traveling. Um, it gets even worse if you have child A and child B, and they don't share a common parent, right? They don't share a common parent. There's nothing in common with them at all. But they need to tell each other something. Uh, and again, this is a problem that React created that you didn't have in the previous world. Uh, so, but that's okay, because again, like I said, 60% of the time, the waterfall model is beautiful, right? It's all rainbows, a lot of complexity disappears. Uh, the issue just, it really boils down to those few cases where you just gotta swim in a different direction, right? Data's going down this way, and you're like, I don't wanna go down this way, I gotta go some other way. Uh, and again, uh, React has this a little bit, it has enough escape hatches, with Ohm, it, it, is, it is harder. Um, and you're really worried about this. And I've, I, <laughs> I, I've seen people write these programs, right? These are the programs that people are writing. They're swimming upstream, and they make messes. And again, a lot of the things we were trying to solve, it just makes a different mess. Um, what we want to provide, and again, I think uh, things like an official solution to uh, Flux is great. Uh, I think... I think there's a lot of opportunity here for the community to, to continue to explore, though. I think Flux is awesome. I think the things that they, they announced yesterday, GraphQL, um, Relay, it's great. Uh, but there's a lot of experimentation to do here because we don't know, right? The whole point of the Flux architecture was like, well, here's one way because we're not sure yet what the right way is. And in fact, the truth is this is software. There's probably going to be four or five ways that, need, that address different dimensions of the problem that you're going to apply to your application. So one thing that I decided to do at Ohm was that I decided that um, having to set up a dispatcher, having to do flux, when all I wanted to express was that child A depends on some data and child B depends on that same data and there's no common parent, I decided that's too common of a pattern. So I came up with a different solution than flux for this because, again, I, I think um, that particular thing where you have a component that just has a data dependency, that should be simple. And so we call this reference cursors, but really, really all they are, they're like the cursors I talked about before, but all it is is the same cursor that we talked about before, it's just observable. You can observe it. Um, it looks something like this. So this is some pseudocode. Uh, sadly, I'm not going to show any lists today. This is all JavaScript. Um, so here's a render function, and list returns an observable cursor. It's, it didn't need to get this via props. It didn't, it's not getting this via state. It's simply saying, I know there's some data that I need. It makes an API call, and then it observes this, right? This is exactly the same as event handlers, right? You, you have your virtual DOM. You attach an event handler. Boom. That's it. You're done, right? You, there's nothing else to think about. And so the way that this works is that imagine that list renders something, and that renders something that gives an editing interface, and say that thing, uh, some subcomponent edits that data. Then what will happen is this observe uh, call actually made an association between this component and the data that it depends on. And if that data ever changes, this thing updates. This is all the work you have to do. No, no events, you, know, you don't have to name your events, there's no dispatch, or there are no actions. Uh, and this is quite nice. Uh, people, I'll get to this slide in a second, but people were complaining a lot about Ohm, and there were legitimate complaints. It was a legitimate problem. 
And when we added that, um, people were considerably happier. Um, again, so there's nothing fundamentally wrong with observation. Uh, there's nothing about this that's against the way that React works. Um, again, we already do this with event handlers on React DOM elements. Um, reference curses, again, they just allow OM components to listen to data structures as you would a virtual DOM element. And in fact, somebody could implement what, I, what I've described. You could go home and be like, okay, I want, I want to do a version of this for uh, my React app. You should try it. Um, there's going to be probably n interesting ways to implement the same idea. Um, so, but if, for those of you that are interested, if, if you actually are going to try it, if you're curious, so what happens is that the way that OM normally works is just renders from the root. But when you observe something, what OM does is OM says, well, that data lives on this path. And after we do our normal render of the application, we, we actually say, let's go through all the paths that we know are being watched, and let's see if that changed. We know all the components that depend on that path. If that path changed, we force update them. Uh, and it's really simple. There, there, there are not many performance implications here, right? What's going to happen? You have some components. We'll find the one that actually changed. We'll force update them. You move on. OK, so uh, that's, that's, that's probably all I'm going to say about, about, about OM, really, at this point. Uh, now let's see what happens um, from once you adopt the OM model, what are the things you get? Like, this is a lot of talk. Like, I'm saying this is a better model, but really, we want to see a demo of how this is any better than what we were doing before. So uh, some of you may have seen this, and I apologize. For those of you that haven't, uh, this, you know, there's, there's a white audience that might not have seen this, and I think this is really cool. Uh, this is uh, CircleCI. They are a continuous integration service. Um, they, they actually have a thing in production. It's really cool. This app, this app is very big for a ClojureScript application, somewhere between 10 or 15,000 lines, which is, for a ClojureScript app, is ridiculous. Um, and this is a demo that they put together, I don't know, three or four months ago. Hi, I'm Daniel from CircleCI. I'm going to do a quick demo to show you what's possible now that we've taken React state service and mounted it into Ohm's global app state. So on the left here, I have Chrome. I'm on the Add Projects page. I'm going to type something in this input to filter repos. And now this input is stored as component local state, so it's transient normally. Uh, I'm going to hit a keyboard combination to save the state. I took the global app state atom, serialized it to a string, and then stored it in this state string variable. Uh, this makes it easy to copy to my clipboard, and now it's in my clipboard. I'm going to come over to Firefox, I'm going to hit another keyboard combination. It's going to bring up this prompt. I'm going to paste the app state string in there. Uh, I'm going to hit OK. It's going to take that string, it's going to deserialize it, and then it's going to reset the app state atom. And so you can see it's restored all the state, even the normally transient input state. Uh, so we're pretty excited about what we can do with this. Uh, you could, instead of sending screenshots to demonstrate a bug, just send the app state. Uh, but if you have a designer, you want to show them an edge case, don't give them a list of steps to reproduce, just give them the app state. So, um, so just to wrap things up, what have we, what has the community and I learned from going on the Ohm experiment. Uh, actually saying React is a solid platform. Um, it's amazing technology. Let's build a different um, interface to it. But we want, we want all the advantages, but we want some, a slightly different strategy as far as building apps. And we learned that you know, interesting UIs are inherently complex. It's, it's, not, it's not the case that like, um, uh, CircleCI's app is small. It's a big, big app, right? It's a big, complicated app. It's not like. Uh, <laughs> Doing any of this stuff is magically going to make all problems disappear. Uh, but what we have learned, uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't ample opportunities to discover uh, incidental complexity. There are things that you assume about app development, you're like, that's just how it is. right? You just assume that's just how it is. And the beautiful thing about the Ohm experiment is that um, by adopting this, this interesting stance about the app state, it can help you identify sources of incidental complexity you never ever even thought of. You never even thought of it as incidental complexity. The fact that you have a QA team and to tell them how to get to the point of the app state in order for them to do the test requires describing this in language, right? You can't just send them your app, right? And the, and the beautiful thing about the own thing is that, yeah, that whole testing problem of like getting to that point, it's not, it's not a problem anymore. Um, it doesn't mean you have to write less code, but there's certain activities we do as software engineers um, where it's a lot less complicated uh, with this approach. Okay, 
So uh, just wrapping things up, so React is an awesome platform. Uh, we love it in the ClojureScript world. Um, they're actually, so Ohm is not special. Like there's like three other popular React bindings, um, all, all slightly different in what feature set they support. And so I just wanna talk about what are the things that we observed are, are weird if you want to use React as a platform. Uh, the one that, uh, that this is more an annoyance, it's workable, but I'd like to maybe see a solution to this, is that uh, a custom tag that isn't React key or a constructor function so really we can't use the React key because that's something that users are supposed to use to trigger unmounting if something changes. Uh, and by forcing the other way for something to get unmounted is for the constructor fun to function to change, kind of stinks from a functional standpoint because it means we have to uh, do something a little bit object oriented. It's minor, but if there was uh, some other custom tag we could supply, that would be awesome. Um, Something else that's a little more radical, um, uh, which I sort of alluded to in the way that uh, reference cursors work, this idea of multi-pass. So you start thinking, oh, React is kind of like a really crazy, it's like a compiler, right? It's, it works on a tree, that's all that it does. Uh, and if, if you're gonna do that anyway, you might as well adopt some of the ideas that are well understood from the compiler literature, right? What if you exposed React, the React com component tree as data, and you could actually pre-process that tree before React sees it? Uh, and so there are lots of opportunities here to do like, oh, I want to make an association between two components. I don't, want to, I don't want to have to write code for that, but at least I can do this in my custom pass on the tree before I pass it on to React for rendering. I think lots of possibilities. Again, this is probably something that probably needs to wait until React is fairly confident about their API. But I think if, if the component tree was data, it would be huge. Um, regular JS classes. This one's kind of funny because uh, this is not really a problem anymore. <laughs> Um, but it used to be huge, this was huge, because in Ohm, and, and this has to be true for anybody that wants to use React as a platform, is that you need to initialize your class in a way that's different, because you may maintain more context and more information than React actually cares about. And so we had to provide a really weird thing um, that I'm really happy we can get rid of. We can just provide our own classes and we can um, do the initialization logic that we need. And that's great. Uh, so just to wrap it up, um, so you know, you know, there's a lot of hype these days about virtual DOM, and I'm here to say we don't care. Like, like not, I don't care, and certainly the ClojureScript community does not care. Virtual DOM was not the reason um, we, we moved towards uh, React. In fact, at any point, we could have just said, screw it, we're going to do our own virtual DOM thing, right? But there's no, there's no, the, the value proposition is very small there, right? Because what do we lose? We lose all the awesome components that people are already building, which have, uh, many have been announced at this conference, right? All these components we get to use. We don't have to wait for our community to produce them. Um, and, and, and the other thing is that like, you know, we, we really did see React as sort of like, not, a, not the virtual DOM, but a DOM virtual machine. And in this sense, it manages resources, it understands life cycles, it can get rid of things, that, you know, and this is really important. Uh, a virtual machine does more for you than just give you, um, you know, some fake DOM. We don't care about that. And it's been great. Uh, again, I think React is moving in the right direction. It's definitely, this conference has given me, given me a lot more confidence in, in React as a platform. Uh, the fact that React is now moving towards um, uh, alternate rendering targets is fantastic. And I definitely feel like validated by going with React. And, you know, so. Uh, anyways, that's all I have. Hopefully I didn't take up too much time. Uh, maybe there's time for questions. Hey, thanks for a great talk. I, by the way, I, I really like that you mentioned that virtual DOM is not the main thing. I, I, I totally agree that that's not the coolest thing about React. Uh, I had a question. Uh, can, you, uh, can you explain how do you think that uh, this cursor or this communication through this cursor between components, how does it relate to two-way data binding? Uh, or is there a single dispatcher in this communication that takes care of only one thing going into the system? No, so, so that's what's interesting about the way that cursors work. So the old version, I mean, number one, let me just step back and say, I don't know if cursors are a good idea. It's just, we had to come up with something, right? No, it's so, all right, it just, it just so, sounds so, like it smells <laughs> all the same problems that we have yeah, with two-day yeah, yeah. data binding. Yes, so, uh, so it's different. So with, uh, with the original version of cursors, we just use cursors and we take them as props. That's the normal way. And we just use diffing. This is exactly the same as what Lee was talking about. Cursors are just a wrap around immutable data. We can do a diff and it's fast. Reference cursors are different. 
Uh, and they're not, so what's interesting about the way I implemented them is they, it's not actually two-way data binding. So what happens is that somebody makes a change and there's just a list of observed paths. There's no actually explicit calling of anything. There's no messaging at all. In fact, so say there's a path that changed in some component updates. You're like, why, why did, who changed that path? You can actually put um, a, a watch on the global app state and say, notify me when this, when this diff appears, and you can see the call stack, and you can find the person that made that change. So you don't have this problem of like events that you have with two-way two, two data binding. It's really just a separate list, which we run over to see what's different using the same techniques Lee talked about. There's no, there's no event watching here. Uh, there, there's no question about like the technique of comparing whether something changed with right. the persistent data structure that's great and that's, you know, that's just great. Uh, yeah, but the, this separate loop and checking things because these observers can trigger something and that will possibly trigger something else and stuff like that. Right, so you do have the problem of like, yes. But you know, it's like this thing. If, you, if your app uses set state, right, that triggers something, that might trigger another set state. It's not, it's not different from that problem. Um, yes, you have to be careful. <laughs> cool, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Cool, thanks.